All right, so I'm going to cover this slide again, but uh, I've got to make some corrections to it because apparently I'm wrong. Um, about, about this slide, which is great. So uh, I'm the CTO at Crunchy Data. I'm a committer, major contributor. Row level security was 9.5. Common recruit is, was 8.4, but the role system was actually 8.1, which Chris actually pointed out to me. And I, I updated some of my other slide decks, but apparently not this one. So, oh well. Um, but yeah, I've been hacking on Postgres for 15 years or so, something like that, for a long, long, long time. Um, so as we go through this, uh, feel free to reach out to me with, uh, with any questions or whatever. Um, I'm happy to take questions as we go. Uh, but basically, I'm just going to kind of run down kind of Postgres from a, a systems administrator kind of, <coughs> kind of viewpoint, right? Um, so first off, let's talk about some terms. So in Postgres, you have what are called clusters or instances, right? We kind of use them interchangeably in the Postgres ecosystem, even though they aren't really that in, in other systems. Um, but what we mean by that is it's one Postgres server listening on one port, which by the way is a Postgres limitation, it's kind of obnoxious. I wish we would allow it to listen on multiple ports, we don't. Um, you can listen on multiple addresses though. It's one set of data files, um, including all table spaces, and one stream of write ahead log, right? So what this means is that if there's a crash, we have one set of write ahead log to replay across all of the databases that were included in that cluster. Um, there are some different things that you can do at a cluster level. There's just basic initialization that's just creating it to begin with, uh, starting and stopping the cluster, right? That happens on a cluster level. You can't like start or stop individual databases. It's the whole thing or nothing. Uh, the file level backup tools, uh, things like backrest, which I'll talk about later, operate on a cluster level because they involve the write-ahead log. You have to save the write-ahead log um, in order to have a consistent backup. And because the write-ahead log operates at a cluster level, it means that all your file level backups end up being at a cluster level as well. Uh, and the same thing goes for the, the streaming replication. So Postgres has physical streaming replication support, and that's done through the write-ahead log. And what that means is that the write-ahead log, uh, or that the system that you're doing the replication with has to be a complete copy of the entire cluster, right? We don't have the ability to do on a physical level like streaming application for um, individual databases. Uh, that is something you can do with the logical replication that Postgres supports. So Postgres does have logical replication support today that you can replicate individual tables even uh, or individual schemas. You then have sets of objects that are defined at a cluster level. Uh, table spaces is a big one. Uh, and then users and roles as well. Um, so what that means is that you have, you know, even though you might have multiple databases inside of Postgres, they all have to have ownership of, you know, from the roles that exist in the system. And all the roles are defined at a cluster level. Uh, table spaces, because they're defined at a cluster level, mean that they can actually have objects from multiple independent databases in them. Uh, which can be handy at times, but can also be a little bit annoying because if you want to drop a table space, you have to connect to every database uh, and make sure that that database doesn't have any objects in that table space. Um, if they do, Postgres will complain at you. We'll, we won't let you drop it if there's any, any objects in there, but it's a little bit obnoxious having to do that. What a lot of this kind of boils down to is that I, I tend to recommend to people, and oh, Chris, maybe you would be interested to hear your comments on this, but I tend to tell people like, Treat Postgres as almost as if databases didn't exist, right? One cluster is like one database, right? I would tend to argue. Having multiple databases underneath of a single cluster is not something that I found typically end up being a good solution because you can't do things like join across tables in different databases unless you use like the Postgres FTW or something and then the performance just sucks. So I, I tend to encourage people to like be thinking about things in terms of databases and, and having one or just a few databases on an individual cluster. That way you can do uh, replication, right? You can do um, things like uh, uh, file level backup and restore. So you can restore just that one cluster, right? You don't have to end up doing a restore that restores you know, 50 different databases that you've got running. Um, the one big downside is that every individual cluster chews up shared buffers. 
right? It, it allocates however much shared buffers you set for that database or for that cluster rather. So that is one of the downsides as a trade-off. If you've got a, a, a server that isn't hit very hard and you want to have one set of shared buffers and you don't care that stuff sometimes has to come off of disk because it's been pushed out, uh, then maybe, okay, fine, right? I can see arguments there where, where maybe having them on the same databases or on the same cluster is okay. Um, but a lot of times it, it just makes as much sense to reduce your shared buffer size and let Postgres use the Linux kernel cache for, for a lot of its buffering, especially if it's a low, relatively low performance system. Databases. So Postgres does have databases, um, and these are basically the container objects for all of the schema and what are called database level objects. Um, whenever you connect to Postgres, you connect both to, you really connect to a database, right? So you connect to the cluster, right? The listening process, also called the Postmaster, but then you tell it, I want to connect to database X, and then the Postmaster will go open database X make sure that you have connect privileges on it, and then start you up, and once you're started, you're working inside of database X. If you wanna go talk to another database, you have to disconnect and reconnect, uh, or you use uh, some kind of inter-server thing like the Postgres FTW. Uh, there are a number of permissions that exist on databases. You have the connect privilege, which allows you, whether or not you can connect at all to the database. Uh, create, which basically means you can create schemas and then temporary, which allows you to create temporary objects. So inside of a database, you have schemas. Everything pretty much lives inside of a schema. All of the, the normal objects that you work with live inside of a schema. Um, so this includes tables, indexes, functions. All of these things exist inside of a, uh, uh, of a schema. Views. Um, and then we have a set of permissions, right? So you can think of schemas in a way as kind of like databases, right? sorry, kind of like directories. Um, and then you have the option of either being allowed to create new objects inside of a schema, or you have uh, the question of whether you're allowed to use objects inside of a schema at all. You then have the ability to have further granular permissions on the objects inside of the schema itself, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, I talked a little bit about table spaces before, but they're basically, it's an alternative directory. Usually it's on like a different file system. Um, because it provides you with additional I.O. channels uh, that are available to the system. Um, and so you can create them using uh, create table space, which is pretty handy. Um, it also means that you can you know, expand your Postgres instance across multiple file systems. Um, basically what goes on table spaces are tables and indexes. Things like views don't actually have storage. Uh, materialized views can go onto a table space. Um, but one thing to realize, of course, as I mentioned before, is that they're cluster level and therefore can contain objects from multiple different databases. Postgres has a write ahead log, right? So this is something that's really, really important. And we've had some changes, right? So prior to version 10, we called this directory pgx log, right? In pg10, we changed it to pg wall because we found that sometimes people thought that those were logs that could be deleted. And that's very bad because we need those right ahead logs to do things like crash recovery. So if Postgres crashes, what happens is that we come back up and we look at what the last checkpoint was in our control file, and then we replay the right ahead log from that last checkpoint up to the end of the right ahead log, and that's how we reach a consistent state. So if you delete it, bad things happen. Don't do that. Um, every single query that comes into Postgres that does any kind of writes is only going to be, um, you know, when you go to commit that query, we will only acknowledge that query once we've written that uh, data out to the write ahead log, right, and synced it, right? This is how Postgres guarantees that we don't ever lose any of your data. All of those changes are written into the write ahead log with a CRC so that we can tell if we have a partial write into the write ahead log. <coughs> One of the things that can happen is that the right head log can become a potential point, point of contention on high write volumes. Um, and this is why it makes sense a lot of times to split the right head log off onto its own file system, onto its own I.O. channel, onto its own disk, or, or SSDs, or NVMEs, or whatever you're running, right? Have it be independent 
uh, because it can become a, a contention point uh, as we have lots and lots of data being written into the right ahead log. Uh, one of the things that you'll be aware about is that it contains both what are called full page changes and incremental changes. And we'll talk about those a little bit more next when we talk about checkpoints. Uh, but just realize a full page image is a full 8K page. Everything in Postgres operates based on these 8K pages, right? We read off the file system in 8K chunks. We write out to the file system in 8K chunks, right? Everything happens in 8K. Uh, periodically, we will take an 8K page that's been modified and write it into the write-ahead log. Um, once we have that written out, subsequent changes will be written out in a, essentially a binary diff method, right? Where we track exactly what change was made to that page. <coughs> In a, at, a, at a binary level, and that's how physical replication in Postgres works. Checkpoints. So, we have this bunch of data in memory, right, in our shared buffers. We go and make some update to that data in memory. That modification of that page dirties that page. Someone then wants to commit that change, right? What do we do? We basically make sure that that page has been written into our write-ahead log, or that change, whatever that change is, has been written into that write-ahead log. But we need to go make that change out to the heap at some point too, right? And that process is uh, called checkpointing, right? Well, checkpointing is the process that makes sure that page gets written out before our next checkpoint, right? Why does this matter? Because during crash recovery, we have to go back to the last checkpoint and replay all of the changes from there. And, make, and that's how we can, again, reach a consistent state. So this is a, a really important thing to be doing um, periodically. So by default, it happens every five minutes. Um, I know people who change that, right? Uh, one of the reasons why people changes, change that is because you may want to um, accept a longer recovery time in the event of a crash in order to reduce the write-ahead log volume. Right? And how does changing the checkpoint timeout reduce the write-ahead log volume? Because after each checkpoint, the first modification of an 8K page results in that full page image going into the write-ahead log. Subsequent changes are only modifications to the page, and those are much smaller right? when those go into the write-ahead log. Um, but if you have checkpoint timeout set at five minutes, then after five minutes, we'll, we will have checkpointed, and the next write to that page will again put an 8K page into the write-ahead log. So it's a trade-off, right? I mean, I've seen people go as high as like half an hour um, on their on their uh, write-ahead log checkpoint timeout, right? And what that means is that you could potentially have as much as like half an hour of changes pending in the event of a crash that you then have to replay during crash recovery. So it's a, it's a real, real trade-off and something to consider. I will talk more about those configuration options a little bit later. All right, so Postgres has, provides a lot of really great packages um, for various different distributions for uh, Postgres. So one of the really nice things is that the Postgres packages that are provided allow you to do uh, concurrent uh, major version installation, which also means that you can have relatively smooth upgrade <coughs> paths. Right, so if you're doing a major version upgrade from 9.6 to 11 or from 10 to 12 or, or what have you, using the Postgres uh, PGDG packages makes that much easier. Uh, those packages are also supported through the community mailing lists and all of the updates to those packages are coordinated by the Postgres release team uh, for all the mining, you know, whenever Postgres does a minor or a major version update. So you know that those packages are always current with whatever the current Postgres release is. So if we're looking at installing on a, on a Debian or Ubuntu style system, uh, app.postgresql.org is the repository for those packages. Um, you can add a PGDG sources list D, which is pretty straightforward. You can see it here. This is all documented. If you just go to app.postgresql.org, you can see it there too. And then you have to install the key for that repository, which is pretty straightforward. And then it's app get update or app update and then app install Postgres. And boom, Postgres is installed. That'll install both the, the server and the client library, the server, the client libraries, and the uh, default clients. Um, Postgres uh, packages for Debian 
do split up the client into other packages. So if you want to, you can just install the PSQL client and libpq and whatnot onto an individual system. You don't have to install the server everywhere that you might want to access Postgres from. When it comes to the configuration on a Debian system, this is a little bit different between the, the two different systems, between Debian and uh, base systems and Red Hat. Um, Debian follows the FHS, file system hierarchy standard, and that means the config files go in Etsy. So in Postgres land, the config files are in Etsy, PostgreSQL, and then that X is whatever the major version is. So that'd be like 9.6 or 10 or 11. And then main is the, um, uh, the cluster name. So one of the really cool things on Debian is that it has a bunch of stuff for cluster management. So you can have multiple independent clusters running different major versions, the same major version, whatever you want, on one Debian instance. Uh, there are then a bunch of wrappers that make working with these different clusters easier. So PSQL on a Debian system is not actually binary PSQL when you run it. It's a Perl script. It's a Perl script that looks for a dash dash cluster option that you provide and then it will figure out what cluster you want to access, what port it's running on, and then it will actually set the appropriate environment variables so that when PSQL is then executed by that script, it will actually connect you to the correct uh, uh, Postgres instance. It will also pick the right PSQL, because PSQL changes major versions too, and it will actually pick the PSQL version that matches, which is kind of interesting. Uh, the actual binaries um, live in user lib PostgreSQL. The logs all go into var log, which is pretty straightforward. Uh, there's also some startup logs, um, although some of that's now been changed with systemd magic. Um, and then we have one um, either init script or now it's a systemd process that will actually start all the major versions and all the clusters for you automatically. So these are those Debian uh, provided wrappers and helper scripts. PGLS clusters, PGCTL cluster, um, are the ones that you really might be thinking about that are not familiar to you. And here you can see an example of running PGLS clusters on my laptop here, where it shows all the different uh, ports that things are running on, whether it's online or not, what the name is. So here you can see I have two different clusters that are running Postgres 11 with different names. They live in different directories. Right, so this is the data directory for the app one cluster. This is the data directory for the main cluster under uh, 11. And then they've got different log files and whatnot. Pretty straightforward. So that's kind of things on the uh, Postgres on Debian kind of level. Um, and like I said, you pass that, uh, it's actually should be two dashes, dash, dash, cluster. And then you specify something like 11 slash main. And then that will connect you to the uh, Postgres 11 cluster named main on a Debian system. All right, now let's talk about Red Hat. So for Red Hat, CentOS, RPM-based environments, uh, we have yum.postgresql.org. Um, it's got a script that initializes the cluster and sets things up for you. Um, you can run multiple major versions in parallel. Um, I will say that unfortunately the Red Hat packages don't have all of the nice cluster management stuff that Debian ones do. But you can still install it and run it and uh, that PostgreSQL 11 setup uh, script, you can specify different data directories for it and that would allow you to have multiple different um, Postgres instances of the same major version running under a Red Hat or a Yum based environment. Um, and then you can enable starting Postgres on boot using this uh, system CTL. So otherwise it's pretty much the same as, you know, running Postgres on, on other systems. Um, one thing I will mention that if you're thinking about doing multiple clusters in a production environment, it's my preference to run those independent clusters with different Unix user IDs or run them in independent uh, containers. Um, just to keep the separation there, right? Containers provide C group separation, which is nice. Um, if you are running them inside of one container or running them inside of uh, one kind of Linux instance, then having different users means that you won't have any chance of confusion about which shared buffers belong to who, right? Because 
that can be bad if you mess it up. Postgres has some checks in place to, to try to avoid that happening anyway. Um, but I, I like to be extra paranoid and run them as independent uh, Unix users. So Red Hat configuration. Uh, by default, the data directory is this varlib pgsql. All of the configuration is in the data directory, which I hate. Um, the reason I hate it is because it means that you're going into the data directory and VIing files, and, and potentially MVing files, and RMing files, and doing other things that are very, very risky to do inside of your Postgres data directory. Um, so I don't like that. I mean, different people do different things, what have you, but um, not my recommendation. Um, so you do have logs that are uh, moved out and put, well, so the logs are also inside of the data directory, inside of this PG log directory. I honestly think that's part of the reason why people went and removed things like PG X log is because the log directory in Red Hat was PG log. And that's pretty freaking close to PG X log. Um, you do need to have an independent initialization script or an independent sysctl setup uh, in Red Hat. Um, it's not like Debian, it doesn't have the nice uh, one kind of service starts them all thing. Um, and it doesn't have any of the helper scripts that are on uh, Debian. So, pick your poison. That's, uh, I'll just, that's all I'm gonna say about Red Hat. Um, I like Red Hat in general, but I'm not a huge fan of how they do that installation. All right, so let's talk about some Postgres config files. Um, so postgresql.conf is your general server configuration. It holds things like what IP address to listen on, what port to listen on, how big shared buffers is going to be. Uh, you then have the HBA file, which configures uh, how authentication is done to the server. Uh, IDENT allows you to do user mappings. And then there's that PG log directory for Red Hat. Um, as mentioned on Debian, the files live somewhere else. And yeah, don't monkey with the data directory if you can avoid it on Red Hat. So. All right, on Debian, there are also some Debian specific config files for you, which are kind of cute. Uh, there's one called start.conf, which allows you to configure whether or not the cluster is started automatically for you or not. Um, I think there's ways of doing this inside of systemctl now too, uh, since we're using systemd. Uh, there's also a pgctl.conf, which allows you to configure uh, different options to be passed to pgctl when it's run out of the pgctl cluster uh, command. And then there's some different environment settings that you can set. You generally probably don't need to monkey with those though. We do also have uh, a PostgreSQL common package on Debian which is what gets used when things like new clusters are created. So you can change what uh, the defaults are for a given cluster. Uh, one of the things that you might want to do in particular is that you might want to specify some options to initDB when creating new clusters. My favorite is dash K. Does anybody know what dash K does to initDB? Is that the C function? The which one? Is that, is that the FC function? It is not the F-Sync option, no. You should know this. You should care about your data enough to know this. Oh, that's a checksum. It's checksums. <laughs> so the dash K option to init DB is enabling page level checksums. It is off by default. Postgres supports page level checksums, but you have to explicitly enable it, and you have to enable it at init DB time, which sucks. It also means that you can't PG upgrade from a non-CRC cluster into a CRC cluster. Not yet, anyway. Uh, there is work going on to improve that situation, but I think it just got punted out of V12, um, unfortunately, but hopefully at some point in the future, we will have support for online enablement of checksums, but it's not there today. <coughs> All right, so, but I did want to mention that uh, dash K is a great option to specify in your createcluster.com for an NDB so that all of your new clusters created automatically have checksums enabled, because it's really good to have. There's some other things you can do around uh, user-specific information and controls for uh, clusters. Uh, this is kind of cute, because you can like set it up so that you know users like A through F or whatever connect automatically to this cluster, whereas everybody else connects automatically to a different cluster, uh, which is kind of cute. Uh, PG upgrade cluster is a uh, directory for scripts to be executed during a PG upgrade. So PG upgrade is how you go from one major version of Postgres to another. 
um, and you can have like pre and post scripts in there uh, for doing uh, whatever you need to have done uh, during that PG upgrade. Red Hat has a few specific uh, Red Hat specific configuration files such as the init script. Um, there have been some changes to reduce the need to modify them, which is nice. For example, the port is no longer specified in the init script, which is handy. Um, so that's a little bit nicer. But uh, otherwise, I don't I don't tend to modify the Red Hat configuration files very much. Not not the Red Hat specific ones. All right, so let's talk a little bit about initial configuration of Postgres. Um, the first one is listen addresses. You may need to configure to allow external access. Um, and then max wall size is something that you probably want to consider increasing if you have any expectation of there being any kind of write load on your environment. Um, what happens is that, remember we talked about <coughs> checkpoints and having to write these 8K pages out and whatnot. Well, you can you know, have uh, the checkpoint happen due to time, which is typically what you want, meaning that you checkpoint every five minutes or so. But you can also have checkpoints be forced if we run out of right ahead log space. So that max wall size there, if we write more than that amount of data in five minutes, we are going to checkpoint immediately, right? Because we need to have, we need to get back underneath of that max wall size, right? In order to, to kind of do what we're supposed to be doing, which is respecting the, the parameters here. But that means that we have to checkpoint faster. Checkpointing faster increases the amount of wall you have. Right, because we have to go do a new full page image after each one, and just overall ends up slowing down the system. Right, so you really want to increase your max wall size uh, if you have a high write load. Uh, the checkpoint completion target, for reasons that still baffle me, we have a checkpoint completion target parameter um, that basically says, well, if you want, you can make it make Postgres checkpoint even faster than what you actually set the timeout to be. Why we have these two things is unclear to me. Because if you wanted to make Postgres just checkpoint faster, just decrease checkpoint timeout. And then we would do it more often. But we also have a checkpoint completion target. Um, I tend to recommend upping this to 0 0.9. That way we actually use the entire time between checkpoints to do writes. Uh, by default, it's set to 0.5, which means that we're actually, we're doing a checkpoint every five minutes, but we're only going to write the data out in the first half of that. Right, is when we're gonna try to write all the data out. And then we're gonna like do nothing for a while. So it's a little bit interesting. And it also means that you end up with discrepancies in latency and things like that. Because you know, depending on when your write is happening, if it's in the, the second half of the checkpoint time or the first half of the checkpoint time, it can make a real difference in how long it took to actually get it out. Um, effective cache size is something else you may want to adjust along with max wall center. Uh, I think max wall center in 11 maybe we up that already, but um, for a while there it was set very low. So you may want to consider increasing that. The reason that matters is because of things like uh, PG base backup uses a wall center, replicas use wall centers, um, uh, PG receive wall uses a wall center. So there's different processes that could potentially want to be a wall center and you want to up that enough to cover all of them. All right, logging configuration. These are things that you should enable. The default logging <coughs> configuration in Postgres sucks. It's terrible. We actually do have a lot of good logging options in Postgres, but they're all disabled by default. Um, so things like logging of connections and disconnections, logging of block weights is really important. Uh, logging DDL, I always recommend logging all DDL unless you really can't for some reason. Uh, logging duration statement, that's in milliseconds. So that's if you have a query over 100 milliseconds, you may want to enable it. If you were here from my last talk, um, I'm probably going to update this for V12 to say set log min duration statement to zero and then set a log sample rate instead because V12 will have the ability to have a, a log statement sample rate that will give you a sampling of queries uh, rather than logging all of them. Log temp file zero means log every temp file that's created. Uh, zero is the byte size, so you could not log really small ones if you wanted. I find that temp files don't get created often enough to be an issue. So I like to log all of them so I can see what's creating temp files. Uh, the log auto vacuum min duration is basically give me all the information about auto vacuum runs. Whenever auto vacuum runs, whatever it does, give me all that information in the logs. Really, really handy. Here's the log line prefix that I typically recommend. Uh, this is basically stolen out of PG Badger, right? Um, so if you're running PG Badger, which you should be because it's really awesome log analysis tool, you can just go pull their log line prefix.
metrics. Uh, this might be slightly different from that, but it's it's basically it's based on that. Um, the default log on prefix is nothing, which is insane because it means that your log doesn't have things like time. So if you're using the Postgres built-in logging, go modify your log line prefix. So here's the basics about PGHBA configuration. Um, so you essentially you have what kind of connection it is, whether it's a local connection or a TCP, or a TCP over SSL or not over SSL, and then what database you're connecting to, what user you're connecting to, uh, where you're coming from in terms of address space, and then what method to use for authentication. We'll talk about that in a minute, but the big important thing here is that this is read in order, first one matches, first match wins, right? So you can have a special database called all, um, or same user, you can have a special user called all, uh, you can also have the addresses be in uh, either v4 or v6. And then there's a special method called reject, which denies access. So again, this is top to bottom, first match wins, the first match is a reject line, then the connection is rejected. Otherwise, it uses one of these authentication methods. And these are the ones that I would recommend that you use. Peer is a great authentication method. It basically punches to the Unix socket and says, Unix socket, tell me who the user is. Whoever the user is, is who that user will be considered to be authenticated as inside of Postgres. And that's great, that's very secure. GSS, also known as Kerberos or SSPI, uh, if you're on a Windows platform. Um, if you're coming from a Windows platform into Postgres on a Linux platform, you can still use this, right? And actually vice versa too, but why would you run Postgres on Windows? Um, I do recommend using GSS. It is a really great authentication method. It integrates great with Active Directory. I just wrote a blog post about how to do it. So if you're not sure, go read my blog post. Um, and it's just basically a good, strong um, authentication method. Uh, certificate base is also acceptable, but it means you have to maintain this whole certificate hierarchy thing, right? And you have to have a certificate authority in the whole bit. Um, and you have to roll your certificate authorities and it's a whole complicated mess. Uh, but it's very secure. So if you want to have, you know, care a lot about security, using client-side certificates is definitely a good solution as well. Then there are the methods that are all right. They're not as good as the first list, but they can be okay. Uh, the first one is Scram. So this is, Scram is a new option that was added uh, to Postgres 10, I think. Um, it's called uh, the Salted Challenge of Authentication Method. It's password based, but otherwise is quite strong. Uh, password based authentication methods suck, uh, they just do, um, but at least this one's pretty strong. So this one, the server never knows the user's actual password, for one thing, which is really, really nice, right? Because that means if your server gets popped, the you know, attacker does not automatically get your password, right? Which is really nice. Um, so, and the client never knows the server secret, right? The server has a secret as well, um, and the client never knows about it. So that's also really nice. So there's some really good uh, properties of Scram. Uh, PAM, radius, and password are all also okay. Um, all of them mean that the user's password is sent to the Postgres server in, in some way, shape, or form. So you have to be using SSL, and you have to trust that your Postgres server never gets popped, or the attacker can monitor that server and discover what your passwords are as you authenticate to the system. Uh, Radius is, uh, there's a caveat on that one, right? Because typically with Radius, you have a one-time password token, in which case they only get your PIN, they don't actually get the, the one-time password code, so that's a little bit better. Um, the ones that I really recommend you avoid our MD5, that's old and is really deprecated now, use Scram instead. LDAP, which has the same problem of the password gets sent over the wire. Um, and yes, you can encrypt it, but it still is not ideal. And not only that, but if you're using LDAP, it probably means that you have a single sign-on environment, which means that if that Postgres server gets popped, they get the password that is the authentication password to your account on the entire domain, which means that they can access any other resources as you, right? At least with password or with PAM or something, you could have a password that is specific to that server. 
so that if that server gets broken into, they don't get any farther, right? With LDAP, you end up not doing that. And you're typically running LDAP in an environment where you have Active Directory and Kerberos, and you should just use that. Um, IDEV, I think we actually rip, ripped that out finally, but it's terrible, don't use it. Uh, and then Trust is just bypassing all authentication. There's some very specific use cases for it, but I'm not going to go into those. PG IDENT. Um, so PG IDENT is a way of mapping from whatever you authenticated as, whatever user you authenticated as, uh, to a Postgres user. Right? And you can provide a map name that you can configure in your pghba.com. So this is basically if you're using some of these more advanced methods like GSS or uh, certificate-based authentication, this is how you can create a user mapping from uh, the authentication user to a, a simpler username in the database, which is nice. All right, so let's talk a little bit about running Postgres. So is Postgres up, right? You can just use service Postgres SQL status, um, and that gives you the status from system D. You can then also call a binary called PG is ready. And then again, if you're on a Debian system, you can pass in this cluster option to have PG is ready called for a specific cluster. You can also connect to the database using PSQL to discover if it's up and online. This is what that looks like on a Debian-based system where I've passed in dash dash cluster. Pretty straightforward. Uh, PSQL is typically your user interface to Postgres. It's really powerful, it's really handy. Um, all the PSQL commands start with a backslash. You can see that backslash question mark. Um, anything else that you send into PSQL will be sent to the server as a query. Um, backslash question mark gives you all of the different backslash commands. If you want to get SQL syntax help, backslash h will give you the SQL syntax for select, create table, create index, whatever you want. It's really, really nice. Um, backslash q or control d will quit. Um, I believe now you can also type quit and PSQL will quit if that's all it gets. Uh, that was like some new addition into 11 or 10 or something. Um, all queries return tables or command results, and you can see expand that output by doing backslash x. So if you want to see who's connected to your Postgres server, backslash x gives you the expanded view. That means you get a separate row for every column, and then you can run this table command. Table is a SQL standard query, by the way. That's part of the SQL standard. I forget which one. Um, but you just do table PD stat activity. It's like a select star, and then you can see a record for every user who is connected currently to the database. And you may also see backend, different uh, backend processes that are uh, operating uh, inside of PGSAT activity, which is nice. You can see a list of what databases exist using backslash L. And then there's a whole bunch of other commands inside of PSQL that are really, really handy. Here you can see I've got a Postgres database and then I have a template zero database. What are templates? So whenever you run a create database command, Postgres basically wants to copy an existing database and make it the new database, whatever the new name is. Um, the source database is considered a template. Uh, and by default, we use something called template one. And you can actually connect to template one and add new objects to it if you want, right? You can install extensions. And then when you run create database, we'll copy those all along out of that template. Uh, this can be pretty handy. Uh, if you screw it up badly enough, you might have a case where you can't run create database anymore, or when you do, your results are, are garbage. Um, and this is why we have something called template zero, which is basically a, if you screwed up template one bad enough, you can explicitly do a create database from template zero. This does require you never modify template zero. Don't do that. It's hard to do. It is a little bit hard to do, but you can do it. You just have to set it as allowing connections, and then connect to it and modify it. But if you do that, sorry, good luck. If you break it, you get to keep both pieces. All right, uh, so there's two main user ways of creating users in Postgres. There's this create user Unix command, uh, and then if you actually connect to the database using PSQL, you can also run create user, which is pretty handy. Uh, you can also run create role, or create group, I think also still works. Uh, create group is basically create role. Um, create role is like create group. Create user is create role with login rights. So the only real difference between users and groups in Postgres is which one is allowed to log in or not. 
Um, otherwise, they, they act basically the same. All right, so here are the different user privileges if you're standing up some new Postgres instance. Don't give people super user access. Don't give your application super user access. There should only ever be one super user. You should only be able to access that super user by SUing the Postgres on the file system, on the box, and connecting. At least that's my opinion. Other people have other options, but be very careful with super user. Uh, create role actually gives you both creating and modification of role privileges. So be very careful with that one. Uh, create database. Again, I don't really like having lots of databases on my server. Giving out create database to anyone seems like a bad idea. I would make that a super user job. Um, we then have login, which you can change to say whether or not a given role is allowed to log in, uh, whether a given role is allowed to do replication or not, uh, whether a role is allowed to change role membership with the admin rank, and then inherit, which basically allows you to specify whether the role gets group privileges automatically or not. So you can set it up so that you have to actually explicitly do a set role to change roles to a different role that has different privileges. By default, inherit is enabled and you automatically get access. We don't just look about this a little bit already. Users are roles, roles are users. Uh, groups are roles too. Um, create role, create users, basically the same thing with the login. Uh, you can grant roles to other roles, but you can't create any loops. Be aware of that. Um, by default, inheritance is there so that you automatically get access uh, to a role who uh, is granted to you. Um, and if you set no inheritance, then users have to do like a, a set role. Kind of like pseudo. That's what that looks like. So if you want to have kind of pseudo-like uh, administration with set role, you can create a role called admin with no inherit. Grant Postgres to admin, and then create some user Joe and grant admin to Joe, right? On login, Joe has the rights of Joe and the admin user, but not the rights of Postgres. Joe can then set role to Postgres. Once that set role happens, Joe also becomes a super user, right? Kind of like pseudo to root. Um, currently, there isn't any way to require a password for set role, though, right? Unlike pseudo. So, something to be aware of. All right, so I'm not gonna cover all the different permissions, but they're here um, for all the different types of objects that exist inside of Postgres. Um, by default, most things in Postgres are secure. When you create a new object inside of Postgres, it typically doesn't allow uh, anyone else to access that. Uh, the one exception to that are functions. So functions, by default, when you create it, the execute privilege is granted, which is a little bit scary, especially if you're playing around with creating um, essentially set UID functions, which you can do in Postgres. They're called security definer functions. Um, the way around this is start a transaction, create your function, revoke execute from public, right? And before you commit that transaction. That way no one else could have seen that function until after you've revoked rights to it. There's some other handy things, like you can set default privileges and you can grant access on all objects in a schema. So those are pretty nice as well, uh, to be aware of them. Uh, there's database size information in Postgres. So you can query a database and say, give me how big the database is. Uh, you can also get this information uh, using backslash L plus, uh, which will give you the size of every database. You can get the size of individual tables using this PG relation, total relation size. That actually includes all of the components of the relation, which is the table, all the indexes, the toast table, everything. Uh, there are ways of getting the information about the individual pieces too if you want it. Uh, there's a PG relation size that you can pass in what you want. So if you wanted to get just the table data, no indexes, etc., you can pass in, you can do PG relation size on just the table name. If you want to get the size, the total size of all tables in a given schema, that's a query that'll do it. Right? It's a little bit complicated, but it's not too bad. Creating table spaces. This is pretty straightforward. So if you are running out of space on your main file system and you want to create a table space, you can basically run this create table space uh, command. The directory uh, should already exist, be owned by Postgres, and should be empty. Um, those are the things, and it should be set to 700 for permissions. And then you do need to specify the full path. Do not put 
Uh, table faces directly on mount points. Number one, always create a directory underneath. And number two, please don't ever put a table face in your data directory. I don't understand why people do that, but they do. Don't do it, it's complicated. Postgres even tries to make you not able to do that for various reasons, including things like what happens when you do backups and stuff. So don't do that. If you want to see the information about a table space, it's backslash db. We'll give you all the information you need. Um, you, can you can also get the table space size uh, using that table space size function, which is pretty handy. Uh, and if you want to drop a table space, that's pretty straightforward here. Just drop table space, whatever. But you might have to connect to all the different databases and issue drop commands for all the objects in order to actually get them all dropped from all of the uh, all the objects dropped before you can drop the table space. All right, if you want to do backups with Postgres, everybody should care about backups. Uh, the first one is pretty straightforward using PG Base Backup. It's actually a very good tool. Um, I recommend that if you're going to use it, you should PG Base Backup into a tarball uh, or into you know using the tar format. Uh, that way, it'll be compressed and checks up. Right, because Zlib automatically does that for you, so you know if the backup's any good or not. Um, if you do a PG base backup into a directory, you don't actually know if that backup has been later modified or corrupted due to some on disk corruption because there's no checks for that. Uh, the only thing that you might have are page level CRCs, which is good, better than nothing, but that involves restoring the database and starting up Postgres and then accessing that page to discover that which can be a little bit obnoxious. Note that you have to have your wall files, right? So PG base backup, when you run it, you can tell it, give me the wall files for this. You have to have the wall files for a consistent backup. If you don't have the wall files, it's not consistent. So be aware of that. Um, it does nicely also include indexes. It's not just tables. So what it means is that you don't have to like rebuild your index. That's different for logical based backup. So there's a logical based backup tool called PG Dump and PG Dump All, which give you essentially logical or text based backups, right? This is kind of like exporting all the data, but the indexes are not included. The foreign keys are not included directly, right? They're, they're included as create foreign key commands. What that means is that when you have to go to restore a logical backup, it ends up being very, very slow, right? It's much slower than restoring a file based backup. So you have to be thinking about this in terms of your restore timeline, right? Like if that deployment of the application went south and you needed to go run to your latest backup and restore it, what are you going to do, right? You probably don't want to re-import all of the data from your PG dump, recreate all of your indexes and revalidate all your foreign keys because it's going to take forever if you have a database of any size. So instead, you should be thinking about having file level backup and that also gives you the ability to have restore points and do uh, point in time recovery and be able to do things um, and, and have like all of your indexes and whatnot. So you, that cycle becomes much, much shorter um, when you're uh, using a file based backup. Be sure to test your restores. Don't assume they work, right? I don't care what your backup methodology is. If you are using PD dump, you have to be testing that you can actually restore it. If you're not testing that your backups are actually good and that you can restore from them, you don't have any. All right? This is what I tell people. You have to be testing these things. And you should be thinking about things like restoring from offsite, fail over, fail back, and how much data loss and how much downtime are acceptable. To restore a PG base backup, um, that's pretty straightforward. You basically just have to extract the tarball into a directory and start Postgres. Right, very straightforward. PG backrest. So this is a tool that I strongly recommend for anybody who wants to go run uh, file-based backup with Postgres. It's got a lot of really cool features. It's built to scale. It handles petabyte-sized databases, and it's actually very, very fast. Right. So you really want to be thinking about PG backrest as your go-to tool, in my opinion, um, if you want to, if you're doing file-based backup. So it has compression, it does checksumming of all files it backs up, it does actual validation of all the page level checksums inside of Postgres, um, and it's it's just great. So strongly recommend it. Uh, there are some changes you have to make to your uh, postgreskill.conf in order to uh, be able to utilize that. Um, I'm not sure I've done it 330? 
Yeah. All right, I got eight minutes, so I'm going to go a little bit fast here. So this is what you have to do inside of your bookofskill.com to set this up. Basically, the main thing is the archive command. There's a couple steps for configuring PG Backrest. There's actually a whole user guide on pgbackrest.org that you can go through that's really straightforward. There's an info command to see all the information about your latest backups. Um, and also includes these days information about your write-ahead log. If you want to do monitoring, uh, check Postgres. If you're using Nagios, Ichinga, MRTG, uh, the check Postgres package is really nice uh, for giving you lots of things to check. These are the things that I recommend checking. There is also a PG Monitor, uh, which if you're running Prometheus, uh, which is a great set of metrics uh, collection tools, uh, PG Monitor is really good for that. Um, if you want to monitor your log files, there is the uh, tail and mail program, which actually understands the Postgres log format, which is pretty nice. Um, you can also process your log, you can also have your log files go to CSV and then do things like process those CSV files. Um, you can also configure Postgres to send logs to syslog, which can then go to Splunk or, or whatever your enterprise solution is for, uh, for log handling. So I'm going to cover these things really quickly. Increase shared buffers, increase work mount, increase maintenance work mount, increase effective cache size, make auto vacuum go faster. Because by default, auto vacuum doesn't go fast enough most of the time. If you see auto vacuum running, you probably want that to happen, number one. And if you see it happening a lot, it might be because it's not going fast enough. If you have a lot of writes, you should be thinking about, hey, maybe I need to make auto vacuum more aggressive. Right, because you don't want it to fall behind. If it falls behind, you can get into some really bad, bad states. So you can increase the number of max workers, uh, and you can decrease the cost delay um, to make auto vacuum go faster. The defaults are really only good for very low transaction rate systems, so be aware of that. Uh, managing connections. So consider using a pooler. If you have to increase max connections over 100, you should be using a connection pooler. Like PG Bouncer is my favorite. It's fantastic. Uh, you should be writing your application so that you can use PG Bouncer in transaction mode, which is fantastic. Um, and that also gives you things like the ability to do uh, failovers, which are completely transparent to the application, which is freaking awesome. Right? So be looking at PG Bouncer for doing that. It's great. Uh, PG Pool is all right, but I consider it to be too much of what it's doing. It tries to do too much. So I like, I like PG Bouncer a lot. Uh, managing locks. So uh, Postgres has a, a limited set of locks called, uh, and those are configured through max locks per transaction. Uh, you may want to increase that if you have a lot of objects in your database system. We talked a lot about checkpoints already. Uh, PG Badger. So PG Badger is a really great log analysis tool, um, which produces some really pretty reports. So if you're doing a lot of logging with Postgres, seriously consider uh, installing PG Badger and having it generate your reports for you so you can check out what's going on. Questions? I got, I got five minutes. Yes, go for it, Chris. Uh, just <clears throat> a kind of a part question, part comment. Uh, you mentioned not using LDAP um, authentication. It occurred to me that where people are using LDAP as a single sign-on, but they're not using Active Directory. Uh, would you particularly recommend like pushing them in the direction of using LDAP to manage a certificate authority and certs instead, or? Um, if it was me, I would say install MIT KDC and run a, run a Kerberos environment. It's actually, you know, once you understand the basics of Kerberos, it's not that hard. It's actually, it's, if you want, I do something. It's a heck of a lot simpler than Active Directory is to run and manage. Oh, yeah. So that would be the direction I would go in. Okay. Yes, you could also do a certificate authority and deploy client side search and server side search and the whole bit. Kerberos is easier. Yeah, it's not, it's not, it's not the open system and interconnect mess that can Yes, it also means it, the other nice thing about Kerberos for those that don't realize it, connections to Kerberos. Uh, connections to Postgres using Kerberos do not involve the KDC, right? Mm -hmm. So there, there is a KDC, but what happens is the KDC issues tickets to the clients, and it only does that like every eight hours or something, right? Because those, those client-side certificates or tickets last 
in the town by default. And then once you have that ticket, it's just a couple back and forth messages to the server. It's actually really fast. Um, it's, and it doesn't involve the, the additional outside network connection garbage that the LDAP stuff does. So it's, it's much more reliable because of that. Other questions? Thank you, really interesting talk. Uh, I wanted to ask what's your opinion on running Postgres in uh, Linux kernel C groups and namespace uh, containers such as uh, Docker? Because there are varying opinions, some people don't see a problem about it because it makes maintenance easier, some uh, see uh, performance problems, but sometimes I, I feel like the reason behind them is a bit. So, so your opinion? sure, sure. I'm happy to talk about that. So, um, we actually Crunchy actually has a whole container suite of containers for running Postgres in containers. Um, I don't recommend Docker because I consider Docker to be uh, less than production ready. Um, if you want my two cents on it, but in general, I don't see a problem using C groups. Um, in fact, I was part of uh, the people that were running Linux virtual servers way, way back, which were essentially the precursor to C groups. And I did it with Postgres, right? The really big important thing that you need to be thinking about when you're running a container-based environment is not typically the fact that you're running C groups, right? And I don't see performance issues with C groups. Where you run into issues is with the storage underneath. Because if you're running containers, oftentimes you're running them on some kind of network file system, right? And that's where you end up having pain. Because those network file systems, number one, they may not be fully POSIX compliant, or you may not you know, have configured them to respect things like F-Sync and locking, right? in which case you end up with corruption. And if you do configure them correctly with the appropriate locking, make sure to respect F-Sync, all of that stuff, it's slow, right? And people complain about it being slow. There's high latency, but, but yeah, you're like sending an F-Sync call to a remote system waiting for it to come back. There's gonna be some latency involved, right? And Postgres does that a lot. Why? Because you are committing a lot of data and you want us to guarantee that that data has been committed out to disk, right? And to do that, we have to call F-Sync, right? And so that ends up being, being expensive. Um, so I would say, you know, containers themselves are not the issue when it comes to Postgres, right? And, and you know, certainly OpenShift or whatever, I, I think is, is perfectly reasonable to run Postgres inside of. As long as you have an underlying file store that is, you know, that has that provides all the guarantees that Postgres needs to operate properly. Yes. So just to uh, um, just just to add to the to the conversation when uh, when you said that uh, Docker is not production ready. So we run a couple uh, several Docker containers, right, for uh, uh, my clients. And uh, there's a script that moves uh, data, uh, copies data around, and checks the exit code of, of CP to make sure that there's no errors. We ran into a problem where one of the files ended up at the destination with zero bytes, and CP did not throw an error. That is, wow. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll tell you, one of the other nice fun things about CP, it does in FSIC. Right. Right? There's no, there's no guarantee that data's on disk after you CP it, which is probably what happened, right? It probably, you know, maybe the CP itself exited just fine, but it never actually made it to the file system underneath. That's a whole other problem with the Linux kernel and F-Sync and that whole monstrosity of a mess that is the way the Linux kernel can lie to, lie to programs about whether F-Sync worked or not, which is just ridiculous. Anyway, Nick, other questions? No, no. Postgres, so PG upgrade supports in place upgrades. Right? Uh, well, we've supported it for years and years. I mean, you can actually. What do we support back to right now? 9.1 or something. I think. Yeah. Is it 9.1? I, I forget. But it, it, yeah, something like that. I think it's maybe from 9.1 or 9.2. There is, there is it, if you go back far enough, and I hope you don't have to deal with this, but if you go back far enough, there is a point where you have to do a stepwise PG upgrade. 
Like, I think if you want to go, like, you have to go from 9-1 to 9-2, and then you can go from 9-2 to, to, like, 11, right? <laughs> right? There is a version somewhere in there, but it's way back. I, I think since 9-3 or 9-4, you can just PG upgrade directly to whatever your target is, and you can do it in place. Uh, if you're interested in how, look for the, the what's called the link mode. Um, so there's basically a mode in PG Upgrade where it will hard link all the files between the two major versions. And that's how it does the in-place upgrade. Other questions? No? Good, I'm out of time anyway. Thank you all. <laughs>